Hello, Healthy 30 students. This is Brian Clark. Today I will be lecturing on nutrition care and assessment. First and foremost, it's important to point out that many patients that are seen in a clinical setting suffer, they already suffer from malnutrition. <laughs> and uh, oftentimes the clinical setting has a tendency not to make it any better. Uh, according to your text, somewhere between 38 to 62 percent of hospitalized patients suffer from malnutrition. Uh, that, that's an issue because you know, these people are, are in a clinical set setting regardless of whether it's inpatient or, or outpatient because they want to get better. And suffering from malnutrition and, and uh, more specifically not getting the nutrients that they need to allow their bodies to heal, uh, that is a performance problem. So we as a healthcare system need to do a better job of educating patients about what they should be eating based upon their personal uh, their personal situation regardless of whether it's acute illness or chronic disease. Uh, illnesses and treatment can lead to mal malnutrition by reducing food intake and that's just a, a reality of, of the hospital. Um, if a person is an inpatient you know, they're being given food that is, is atypical to their diet. Um, they probably don't feel good when you put those two factors together. Um, a person feeling poorly and being exposed to food that is atypical, uh, well, they have a tendency not to eat. Um, and if a person is not eating, they're not going to be getting an adequate amount of, uh, of amino acids. When you don't have enough amino acids, then cell, cell formation is going to slow. And when, when a person is trying to recover, um, that that can that can be a problem. Uh, certainly, treatments can sometimes interfere with digestion as well as uh, caloric and vitamin and mineral absorption. It can also alter nutrient metabolism and excretion. And um, that la those last few bullet points there are pretty straightforward. Some dietary changes during illness that we see, uh, luckily they're, they're oftentimes temporary, especially if a person has an acute illness, and um, you know, those oftentimes are not, not that big of an issue. Um, however, for those that suffer from chronic disease, uh, long-term dietary modification usually is necessary. Uh, when you think about the, the three primary chronic diseases in the U.S., uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and cancer, uh, each a, a person suffering from any one or multiple chronic diseases that I just mentioned, uh, they can benefit by changing their dietary intake long term. And you know, the, the recommendations are not necessarily overly complicated. Um, you have the ability as a clinician to influence a patient and in particular to to influence how they eat and that makes for better outcomes. Uh, that's summarizing what I just said a moment ago. Responsibility for nutrition care. You'll notice that I highlighted the health care team. That means that everyone on the healthcare team has a responsibility for making sure that a person is well educated about what to as well as what not to eat, especially when you consider the three primary chronic diseases that we see in the U.S. And oftentimes, even if you're not dealing with with a person specifically uh, because of their diabetes or their cardiovascular disease or a cancer that they may be dealing with, um, you can still make some pretty good general recommendations to that individual. Um, because, for example, if, if you end up working for a specialist and um, yeah, that, that specialist is um, is in a field of medicine that's not necessarily directly related to diabetes, cancer, or cardiovascular disease. If you have a patient that comes in to see that specialist, but that patient has cardiovascular disease, cancer, or diabetes, you should still feel empowered to make recommendations. Uh, a term that you'll hear in the health healthcare setting is or I, should, uh, I guess I should say a phrase, a phrase that you'll hear in the clinical setting is uh, critical pathways and um, that refers to the, uh, 
the coordination of care that allows for uh, allows for a person to be given information as it relates to their nutrition and, and that's just indicating that everybody plays a role. Physicians, they certainly play a role. Uh, their primary responsibility is to prescribe diet orders and they're going to doctors are going to be primarily relying on other healthcare professionals to alert them to nutritional problems and um, you're not going to see physicians doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, dietary counseling that's just not the nature of the beast and more often than not that's going to be performed by a registered dietitian and I do want to emphasize that RDs uh, that they are, are board certified licensed individuals and um, that they should never be referred to as a nutritionist um, a, a, anyone can call themselves a nutritionist uh, someone working behind the front desk at your local uh, health food store could call themselves a nutritionist and ra registered dietitians are clinically trained professionals and they provide what is called medical nutrition therapy. Uh, they can conduct nutrition slash dietary assessments. They diagnose nutritional problems. They develop, implement, and evaluate nutritional care plans. And um, finally, the last thing that, that many dietitians do is they plan appropriate plan and approve appropriate menus depending upon a person's clinical status. <clears throat> There's also another position called a registered dietetic technician. These people usually work directly for slash with the dietitians and basically they're their personal assistant and they can do many of the things that a dietitian does and largely it's up to the dietitian to give that person the amount of autonomy that they feel that they need to uh, assist with implementation and monitoring of nutrition services. Nurses, and based upon your introductory letter, letters, pardon me, uh, I know that most of you all do plan on being nurses. So um, you know, this is where this information I'm getting ready to cover. Uh, it, it's um, it's what you should be aspiring to. Um, nurses are going to be the first line of defense, and yes, you will serve as a screener for nutritional problems and it is completely and totally okay for you to identify a nutrition issue and to pass that on to to the doctor and or the di dietitian. Um, you do provide some d direct nutrition care and those include encouraging patients to eat, finding practical solutions to food related problems, recording patients food intake, administering tube and intravenous feedings and a nurse must assume much of the, of the responsibility for nutrition care in facilities without a registered dietitian and in, in some assisted living facilities that is the case. Uh, right here you'll see table 17-1 and um, in particular I want you to look down to the third from the last bullet point there and um, you'll notice that it says risk for aspiration and it certainly is a nurse's responsibility to assess that. Um, many of you all will, will probably end up working with the senior population and many of you all may even end up working in some type of assisted living facility and it is the nurse's responsibility to identify the risk for aspiration. A lot of seniors, they end up eating foods that they should not be, that they just physically are not able to eat at that stage of their life. And it does pose a risk for aspiration. And it is your responsibility to reduce, reduce risk and reduce liability by identifying that. <clears throat> Uh, some other healthcare professionals that may assist with nutrition care, pharmacists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers, speech therapists, nutrition, new, I'm sorry, nursing assistants, and home health care aides. And all that's to say that everyone who is, um, everyone who is trained and everyone who has information about appropriate dietary intake 
should feel empowered to share that information with patients. And going back to what I was saying a few moments ago, it, it does not, it doesn't take a lot of training to become well versed in recommendations that you make to a person with cardiovascular disease or the recommendations that you make to a person with diabetes. You know, if you see a diabetic sitting in the waiting room eating a candy bar and drinking a soda, well, you as a as a professional need to address that problem um, because that is affecting the health and well-being of the patient. And uh, so, sometimes they, they may know, uh, that they, they may have some idea that it's not good for them, but they need to hear it time and time again from prof professionals like yourself. Nutrition screenings, uh, ideally those are going to be conducted within 24 hours of admission to a hospital or other type of extended care facility. Uh, you, you'll notice there that the slide says also including included in outpatient services and community health programs. Well, maybe in a perfect world, <laughs> but um, not usually. And, but a, a nutrition screening can identify malnutrition, uh, oftentimes PEM, and this is especially true with with youth. Uh, you know, we live in a society where there is a certain percentage of the youth population that's doing nothing other than eating chips and cookies and pastries and snacks in general and they're, they're, that, that is 95 if not more percent of their daily intake and they're, they're drinking sodas and they're getting very little protein in their diet and when you, you give a child the choice between eating a, a Swiss cake roll or um, sitting down and eating uh, some vegetables and eating um, a, a a baked piece of chicken. Well, yeah, I think we all know the, the choice that a child is going to make. And oftentimes, children have free reign of the kitchen, and they they can just go in and grab a cookie or a cake out of a drawer. And um, you know, when dinner time comes, they're they're not hungry, and they just keep on repeating the same pattern of. Of, um, of dietary intake where they're eating foods that are lo very low in protein and ultimately that ends up uh, resulting in, in, in PEM, um, protein energy malnutrition. Uh, I'll ask that you look over table 17-2. It indicates the, the information that should be included in a nutritional screening. Here you see the nutrition care process illustrated visually on the right hand side. Uh, the the variables in nutrition the nutrition care process include first and foremost nutrition assessment nutritional diagnosis nutritional intervention and nutrition monitoring and evaluation and that last one probably not uh, performed as comprehensively now as it should be you know, even when you you look at um, you look at things like uh, cardiac rehab programs. You know, we, we know full well that a person who suffers from cardiovascular disease, if they go back to eating in the same manner that they did before, that they're going to clog up those stents, they're going to clog up those, those bypasses, and that in very short order there's going to be consequences. But that doesn't have to always be the case. I, I want you to feel empowered to change the way that we educate patients and you need to be emphasizing this is important. Um, yeah, admittedly, um, yeah, the, um, the clinical processes that occur, the therapies and the treatments and the surgeries, those are important, but also very important to long-term outcomes is a patient's ability to make a lifestyle change and you are the person that has the ability to to educate and empower patients. So I want to empower you to empower patients to make a change in their life and to implement much of this information that you're learning in this class. Thanks for your attention and we will continue with lecture two at this point.